as we've already said, do be praying this week for Vacation Bible School. You know, we've, we're probably all raised up in some form of a Bible school. We know that the Lord really works in that, that time to teach the gospel to children. I know that there are still, I can still remember seeing decorations from when I was a kid. I can remember seeing, hearing lessons uh, about Jonah or about Jesus walking on the water. And the stories that we read from the Bible, they stick with us. They, they remain with us. And the main part about that is the gospel, right? It's, it's the gospel that we hear. We hear it over and over and over again. It gets in our minds and we pray that it gets in the children's hearts. And it continues on for a lifetime. We want to continue doing what the Bible tells us to do and training up a child, right, in the way it should go. And when they are old, they will not leave it. They will not depart from it. And that's what we want to do. So please be praying specifically this week. And remember that we will be having an adult class uh, uh, I believe it's 7.30, starting at 7.30. So we'll be doing that. We want to pour into everybody as much as we possibly can. We don't want anybody to have an excuse and say, hey, I didn't get to hear the Bible. We want to give it to you. We want to feed it to you. We want to pour it out to you. So please come this week. We'll, we'll, something for everybody. So anyway, let's be looking in our Bibles to the book of Ruth, chapter 2. We've been studying uh, for a few weeks in the book of Ruth. We found young Ruth in the pagan place of Moab. She was not a follower of Christ, but God in his sovereignty, God in his holiness, God in his providence. You know, providence isn't a word we hear too often today, but providence is the invisible hand of God that reaches out and that moves and that, that brings us from circumstance to circumstance. And we might not always realize that while it's going on, but after we look back over the period of our life and we say, how in the world did I get here from there? How did I get to, where, get to be where I am today? Well, that's God's hand of providence. And we can see God's mighty hand of providence moving in the life of Ruth. God found her in the pagan place of Moab, brought her to live in Bethlehem, to live among his people, to be taught the word of God, put her under uh, her mother-in-law, Naomi, and God's about to do something else big in her life. Now, she doesn't know that. It's going to be a surprise to her. The good thing is, there are no surprises to God, right? There are no surprises to God. God knows everything. God is orchestrating everything according to his own plan. And just as he wants it to happen, it's going to happen. Because he's sovereign. He can do it that way because he's God. But on our side of this, we don't know what's coming tomorrow. We're surprised when we see things take place. But it's uh, sometimes we go through bitter times. And we spoke about that in the last message. How Naomi told the people of Bethlehem, Don't call me Naomi anymore because Naomi meant, meant pleasantness. But call me Mara. Mara is bitterness. She says, I'm bitter because I've been, God's dealt bitterly with me. She says, I've evidently committed some kind of sin and God's judging me for that. But that's not at all what God was doing in her life. God was bringing about a wonderful plan. God was orchestrating providentially his plan through this family. So let's, when we, when we find ourselves in painful situations, when we find ourselves in hard places, let's view our troubles and our problems through the lens of the gospel. What is God doing in my life right now that's going to bring him ultimate glory in the end? Have you ever thought of it like, thought of it like that? When we go through uh, illnesses, when we go through struggles in life, when we go through the hardest of situations, it's something when we'll stop and we'll say, you know what, God is orchestrating this right now, the events of my life, because there is a place that he wants us to get one day that he will get ultimate glory in the end. And we're a part of that. We're a part of bringing God glory. So that's a wonderful thing. Let's look this morning in Ruth chapter 2. We're going to look at the next step in the life of Ruth. Ruth chapter 2. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she 
set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was the, of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. He said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. They answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came, from, who came with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she has continued from early morning until now except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping, and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her roasted grain, and she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness that you give to us in the gospel. I pray as we study this young woman's life in your word, Father, that you would open our eyes and pour out your blessings upon us and add your blessings to the reading of your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We come to a point in the life of Ruth where here she is in Bethlehem. They're settling in. But now... These are two widows. The mother-in-law is a widow. The daughter-in-law is a widow. And they live in a time that's very hard for women. They live in a time that's very hard, especially if you do not have a male person in the home working. It's very hard for them. It's a different culture than it is for us today in many ways. But we can also relate to that uh, in some ways of people who are on fixed income and things of that nature. Well, God had set up years before in His law some ways to help the widows and, and the poor and the impoverished. And one of those things was that during the time of harvest, when the people who owned the field, they had servants reaping the harvest, that if you were a widow or you were impoverished in any way, you were allowed to go behind the reapers and anything they dropped, the reapers were not allowed to pick it up. God said they were not allowed to pick it up. If they dropped anything, it would stay on the ground and those who had need would come behind them and pick up what they had dropped. It was God's way of helping those in need. Uh, and so God, that, that tells us something about God, right? God cares for the widows. God cares for the fatherless. God cares for those in need. And he even made provisions in his law to help them. So anyway, we see this taking place. And this is the world in which Naomi and Ruth lived. So Ruth, they woke up one morning and Ruth told her mother-in-law Naomi, let me go to a field and find a place where I can glean and take part in this grace that God's given us. So Naomi said go. So she goes, and I, I love this, the, the scripture starts off introducing us to Boaz before we actually see Boaz. It says, now Naomi had a relative of her husband, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. So the, the central figure in this chapter is Boaz. 
Now we know that Ruth, the, the book is named after Ruth. And, and Ruth is going to be in every step of the way. But this chapter is dedicated to Boaz. Because Boaz is the main character in this chapter. And he, he is the one we're going to be looking at. Uh, we see that Boaz did some things for Ruth in this chapter. Now I know this is Father's Day. Well, Brother Matt, why didn't you break off from your uh, regular series and preach a message on Father's Day? And, and, and sometimes I do that. But I wanted to stick with this this morning, and I considered that. But as I looked at this, we see a good example of a great man in this text. But this great man does not point back. And it can. We can draw some similarities. We need to be like Boaz because of this. We need to be like Boaz because of this. We could draw those comparisons. But really, you know who Boaz points towards? It's not me, and it's not you, it's Jesus. Boaz is pointing us to Jesus. Boaz, in this text, is a representative of Jesus and what he does for us. What greater figure can we glorify this morning on Father's Day than to direct the fathers to Jesus? You want to be a good father? Do it like Jesus did. You want to be a good husband? Live your life like Jesus lived. You say, well, Jesus wasn't a father. Jesus wasn't a husband. No, but he sure set down the standards for how we are to live. He taught his disciples all of these things. He is the ultimate authority of all things. So let's be pointed to Jesus this morning in his word. And I want to see if in this text what Ruth received from Boaz. Here Ruth is going to find a place to reap. Now there are probably many fields for Ruth to choose from. And I like how the scripture says that it says she happened upon. <laughs> she happened upon a, a section of the field that belonged to Boaz. Now we understand something here. Nothing in your life and nothing in my life happens by chance. Absolutely nothing. We, we like to... We like to talk about things and we hear this more and more and I'm seeing there's more and more things that they call karma or chance or luck. That is not how the universe operates. The, how this thing operates is by divine sovereignty of God, divine rulership of God. Nothing happens to us by chance. Ruth did not happen to this place just because it was a lucky day, but God in his providence and God in his sovereignty brought Ruth to this place on this day to meet a specific person. And that is important. And she comes to the field. She begins to glean after the reaper. She asks permission. But I want us to notice some things. Some things that she receives from Boaz. Notice when Boaz comes. Look at verse 4. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. And he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Now this is a common uh, greeting from someone. But we do see that he was a man of God. And then it says this, Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? Now I want you to understand something. There are a lot of young women in the field this day. There are a lot of widows in the field this day. Now there are some reasons why Ruth would have stood out among the others. She was probably younger than most of the others for one thing. But also she was of a different nationality. She was not Jewish. So there was probably some reason she would have stood out. But she caught Boaz's eye. And she, here's what the first thing she receives from Boaz. She receives his attention. She receives the attention of Boaz. Boaz notices her. He asks about her. They, the servants begins to tell Boaz the story behind why she's here. How she had lived in Moab and her husband had died. She came back to Bethlehem with her mother-in-law. Now she's taking care of her mother-in-law. And Boaz hears all of this. Well, what does this mean for us today? How do we, what do we do with this? That, that, that she received attention from Boaz. It's important to know, since Boaz is a representative in this text of Jesus, that we... As lowly as we are, we as unworthy as we are, have received the attention of an almighty figure. And that is God. There is not one soul in this building who has not received attention from God. God knows your name. 
God knows your feelings. It goes deeper than the outside. God, obviously, He knows what we look like. He knows what we like. He knows what we don't like. He knows how you feel. He knows your reaction to situations. He knows you better than anybody else on this world knows you. He knows you so well that He has the hairs numbered on your head. He knows exactly how many hairs you have. God Almighty has given you His attention. Wow! How amazing is this? That God knows us in this fashion and God has given us His attention. I love what uh, Ruth says in this in uh, down in verse 10, then she fell on her face. And, and we're going to get here in a moment, but I want to go ahead and just use this now. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes? When I think about the fact that God knows every sparrow that falls, and God knows every flower on earth, but more than that, God knows the number of the hairs on her head. God knows us intimately in ways that no one else knows us. When I think about that, I can understand what Ruth said. She says, why in the world have I found favor in your eyes? I'm not worthy of your favor. I'm not even one of your people. I'm a stranger. What does that mean? She was a Gentile. She was not Jewish. She was not the same nationality as Boaz. And that was a big deal in this time. But that didn't matter to Boaz. That did not um, 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 dictate his reaction to Ruth. He gave her his undivided attention. Now how in the world, this tells us something about God. How in the world can God give us his undivided attention? Now I want you to understand something about me. Some of you already know this. I do not have the, the ability to do a lot of different things at one time. And I'm sure many of you men share this with me. I, if you're talking to me and there's children playing over here, I do not know what you're saying. So just as just I want you to know, so you need to pat me, say, hey, are you listening to me? Do you hear what I'm saying? Or if I'm reading something and Bryson's playing in the background, I may read three or four pages and go back and I won't have a clue what I've read. I cannot do too many things at one time. I have to give my entire focus to one thing at one time always. I cannot split that. But God, in His holiness, in His sovereignty, in His infiniteness, knows everything about everyone on the face of this planet and everyone who's ever lived and he knows the numbers of the hair on their head he has given his undivided attention to everyone and that's amazing God gave us his attention Boaz gave his attention to Ruth but it doesn't stop there he also gives something else he, he's learning things about Ruth in verse 6 and the servant who was in charge of the reapers she is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab she said please let us glean let me glean here they gave her their permission then verse 8 then Boaz said to Ruth now listen my daughter do not go to glean in another field or leave this one but keep close to my young women her, his servants let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping go after them have not I charged the young men? So anyway, we find here, not only does Boaz give Ruth his undivided attention, he gives her welcome. Now I want you to understand this is big. Culturally, this is big. This is something that possibly people and other owners of other fields would not have done. The reason we talked about it a little bit, that she was not Jewish. She was a Gentile. She was Moabite. The Jew, during this time, they had a word for Moab that they described Moab, and it was God's wash pot. And you can imagine what that means. They despised, to their sinfulness, they despised other people. They wanted to separate themselves from other cultures. Now, there was times when God said, separate yourselves from people. But that was for religious purposes. That was not to hate other people. They took it too far. They did things they were not supposed to do. But Boaz went against his culture and he welcomed this young woman. Now, this is a picture of Christ. Now, Christ is holy. Christ is sovereign. He is the only one who can save. He is worthy of all praise. What should he have done with us? He, well, listen, we spoke about this a little bit in Sunday school this morning. He would have been completely justified if he would have never given anybody. Now listen, if he would have never given anybody the opportunity of salvation, he would have been justified because he's holy. 
everyone who has ever lived deserved to go to hell. That's not just something preachers say. That is a fact. No one deserves a, the, 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 the ability, the, the, the opportunity to go to heaven to be forgiven of their sins. That is called grace. We sung about grace this morning. Grace is what opens the door for us. God in His love opens that door to us. He gives us the opportunity to trust Him. He gives us the opportunity to receive His grace. He did not have to do that to be justified. He would have been justified if He would have poured His wrath out on every one of us. Boaz welcomed Ruth. The culture would have looked at Boaz and they would have said, you don't even have to look at that woman. Much less speak to her. You would be justified and tell her, you need to go to another field and glean somewhere else. But that's not what Boaz did. Boaz did a gracious thing. Boaz did the merciful thing. And Boaz welcomed her. Not only gave her permission to glean in his field, but he went a step further. He said, don't go to another field. Don't leave. There's plenty here for you. There is plenty here for you. And if you'll, you will stay in my field, I will protect you. I will give you everything you need. I will make sure you do not leave this place hungry if you stay in my field. I believe Jesus does the same thing for us. We are welcomed into the family of God even though we don't deserve it. And then we are called upon to remain. To remain faithful to Him. To not go to other places to find uh, someone to fulfill our needs. When Christ is all that we need to fulfill every need we have. He's all we need. In our good times, He's all we need. In our suffering, He's all we need. When we're high or we're low, whatever it, our condition may be, He's all that we need. And He has invited us to stay, to, to be in His field, to be in His family, and to remain there. He encourages us to faithfulness. And we are encouraged today as Christians to remain faithful. This is where our sanctification comes in. You hear le lessons, Bible lessons, you hear sermons, and you hear this a lot, t people teaching on faithfulness. Remain faithful, do not leave, do not forsake. That is an important thing to hear over and over again because Christ, is wa Christ wants you to be faithful faithful. So we see that Ruth received attention. And then Ruth received welcome. Number three, Ruth received protection. He told her not to go to another field. He says, have not I, have I not charged the young men not to touch you? Now, obviously this is in a sinful world. And any of these young men could have tried to take advantage of Ruth. But you know what? Boaz took the responsibility of protecting her. Boaz, the one who owns the field, says, Do not touch her. They hadn't even said they wanted to touch her. But Boaz said, Don't touch her. You leave her alone. You make sure she's protected. I'm going to make sure you're making sure she's protected. Don't touch her. We have a God in heaven who loves us so much that He not only gives us His attention, and He not only welcomes us into His family, he also protects us. I think about the shepherd psalm, Psalm 23, where the, the, the David begins to speak about the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Uh, and and he, he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. The good things, the sweetness about being with Christ, our shepherd. But then he goes on and he says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they protect me. The, the staff is for keeping the sheep in. The staff would have a crook in the end, and if a sheep went too far, the shepherd would take that staff and would bring him back. The, so it was for, to protect the sheep from leaving. The rod was, for, uh, was a weapon against enemies, was a weapon against uh, wolves or coyotes or whatever the animal might have been that was trying to get the sheep. So your rod and your staff are protecting me. God is actively protecting you against the enemy. There is an enemy of our souls, church, that hates us, that wants to see us fall in every way. But it's important to know that that enemy cannot get to us outside of God's permission. 
To get to us outside of God's permission, he would have to penetrate the wall that God has built between him and us, and he cannot penetrate that. Now, I emphasize without his permission because there are times that God gives his permission. Consider Job. God allowed, the Job, God allowed the devil to do some things in Job's life. But God worked it all out towards Job's good in the end. So the Lord is our protector. And He is there providing that protection for us. The greatest protection He provides for us is the protection of our salvation. You cannot be plucked out of God's hand. I'm sure that if the devil could pluck you out of God's hand, he would be doing it. But the devil cannot pluck you out of God's hand. It's not possible. When the Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have what kind of life? Everlasting, eternal life. That everlasting, that eternal life begins at salvation. Begins the day we get saved. It doesn't begin when we die. It begins when we get saved. When I get saved, I now have the gift of eternal life. And I cannot be plucked out of His hand. But not only can I not be plucked out of His hand, I can't jump out of it either. <laughs> David prayed when he sinned greatly before God. Now you have to understand the things that David did. David took advantage of a woman. David committed adultery. David had that woman, her husband, killed. Horrible, terrible, vile things. David, when he prayed, he didn't say, Lord, restore unto me your salvation, did he? He didn't say, restore unto me your salvation. What did he pray? Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. You see, we as saved people can sin, we can fall, and we can lose our joy. But we can't lose our salvation. Why? Because it's not ours to begin with. It's His that He gives us. And when He gives us, His gifts do not, are not with repentance. He will not take it away from us. Now, there, are, there will be, if you're God's child, there will be judgment. There will be uh, a chastisement on the believer's life. Maybe to the point of taking us out of this world. Maybe to that point. But you cannot lose it because you're not holding it. He's holding it. He is our divine protector. So she received protection from Boaz. And again, she said, Why have I found favor in your eyes? And I believe this is the heart of worship. When we consider his attention, when we consider his welcome, when we consider his protection, and even the next point we'll look at, it should drive us to our knees in worship. Why have I received your attention? Why have I received your welcome? Why have I received your protection? Why have I found favor? That word favor is another word for grace. Why have I found grace, God? I did not deserve grace. But you gave it anyway. You gave it freely. You gave it willingly. Thank you for this grace. Not only did she receive protection from Boaz, she also received provisions. And not only provisions, but abundant provisions. He, he invites her to continue in the field, to not leave. He says that you've come to take refuge in the wings of God, which speaks to his protection. But then, verse 14, And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she, so she sat beside the reapers. And he, who is he? Boaz. Boaz is doing something. What is he doing? He passed her roasted grain. He is serving her. He is providing food to her. This is off of his budget. This isn't, this isn't grain that she picked in the field. This is out of Boaz's supply. So he is feeding her. She sat until she was satisfied. That's a beautiful picture. She sat there and ate until, I don't know when the last time it was that Ruth ate till she was satisfied. It had probably been a while. She was probably, between her and her mother-in-law, eating rations, small portions, so they could prolong it to the next day and even the next week. But she sat here and ate until she was satisfied. And then when they were finished, he instructed the young men, I love this, he said, let her glean even among the sheaves. That means let her glean in the best part of the field. And do not reproach her. And also, here's something that's so wonderful. And also, pull out some of the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean. To glean. What is this? He says, the grain you have in your bags, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take out a handful of that grain 
And if, you're, and if roost behind you, I want you to put it on the ground for her. Now, remember the rule is if you drop some, you can't pick it up. And here's what Boaz said, I want you to drop it on purpose. I want you to take handfuls and drop it up. Make sure we send her home with a load that she can't even hardly carry. What is this telling us? Boaz wanted to provide for Ruth. Our Heavenly Father is such a great provider. The Bible speaks that, that He gives us abundantly more than we can ever ask or think. That's what God does. This is why Boaz is a picture of Christ because he is acting on the behalf of Christ to Ruth. And he is loving her. He is giving to her. He is providing for her. And this is what Christ does for us. I can look back over the period of my life and I don't understand why I received some of the things that I received. I didn't deserve them. You say, well, I've never received one thing I didn't work for. That's a good way to be in this life of trying to work hard and on that. That's not a good way to think spiritually. We say, well, well, well I, you know, I don't take handouts from nobody. When you come to the realm of spirituality, you cannot come with that attitude. When we come to the realm of spirituality, we say, Lord, I am a beggar. I have nothing to bring. I can't provide for myself. I do not have this ability. God, I am destitute. And God gives and gives and gives abundantly, exceeding, measure it up and overflowing. That's what He does for us in the grace that we need. Think back to situations in your life that it was spoke about again, once again this morning in Sunday school that, that you're going through situations that you should have broke down, maybe even quit. But you didn't. There was a peace there. There was help there. There was comfort there that you couldn't explain. That was some handfuls on purpose. Think about times when you prayed for your children who may have been wayward and, and, and not living for God and God brought them back. That was handfuls on purpose. Think about times when you were depressed and you needed something. You needed encouragement and you opened the Bible or you sat in church and heard the Word of God preached and God gave you exactly what you needed for that moment. That was handfuls on purpose. That God was providing for you. He gives us exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask or think. He is the great provider of our souls. That's the God we serve. So fathers, you want a good example to look to? Look to Jesus. How do you provide for your families? Look at what He does. He even gives us love when we don't deserve it. Handfuls on purpose. So... What did Ruth receive from Boaz? She received attention. She received welcome. She received protection. She received provisions. And then she was loaded down with so much to bring home to her mother-in-law. But what she didn't realize, I'm going to go ahead and give you the rest of the story. We're going to continue preaching it, but I'll give you the rest of the story. She's going to own the field. She's, she, she's going to marry the man who owns the field eventually. She's going to own the field. Look at the love of God for us. The Bible teaches us that one day, here's the end of the, our story, one day we're going to be kings and priests with God. What does that mean? I'm not even sure what all that means. We're going to reign with Him. We're going to be with Him forever. Not talking about Him. There'll be no need for faith. There'll be no faith because faith will have become sight and we'll be face to face with Christ and we will be with Him so what are the struggles we have on this earth? What of the pains we have on this earth? Look what we will receive one day. And we don't serve Him for the receiving. We serve Him because we love Him. But there will be benefits. There will be benefits. So today, if you're here this morning, and you don't know the owner of the field, what in the world do I mean by that? If you haven't met Jesus Christ this morning, you need to understand how much you're missing out on. You're missing everything. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What will he give in exchange for his soul? If you've missed Christ, you've missed everything. If there's any message from the graves, it's if you miss Christ, you miss everything. Don't miss Christ. Don't miss the gospel. Humble yourselves. Repent from your sins. Trust Christ as your Savior. And today, if you have done that, don't become downhearted. Don't become depressed. Don't become discouraged. Because you serve a God who owns the field. <laughs> and He can give you exactly what you need, exactly when you need it. 
from his abundant supply. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we come before you in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. We thank you so much for your divine grace. Father, Lord, we pray that we would be people that depend on you. Let us not be prideful and think we're going to do it ourselves because we'll never do it. But let us be people that are beggars for your mercy, beggars for your grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.